Hi. Um, thank you all, uh, the people that are joining us to watch this amazing uh, Q&A with the incredible writing staff of uh, Better Call Saul. Pr pretty much uh, the best modern noir unrolling on uh, the wonderland of television these days. It's incredible. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to, I have a lot of questions. I'll ask a few of mine, uh, but I have way too many. I'm going to try to keep them to a minimum uh, to let some of you guys' uh, questions uh, roll out. Uh, I, I guess I'm going to start, I'll start with uh, Peter, and then we, you can just kind of toss it around the room. I have not been in this writer's room. I don't know what the pecking order is. They haven't jumped me in. I don't want to step on any toes or anything like that. Um, but my first question is, how aware are you, how aware do you guys have to keep yourselves uh, as to which characters know what and what characters don't know things. And I'm, I'm especially talking in terms of <clears throat> the characters of Nacho and Kim. Nacho is someone who is lying to everyone. I've never seen a character who has more plates spinning and lies going at the same time and has to be hyper aware of them or he's dead. Um, and then opposed to him, Kim Wexler, probably the, the most morally grounded person on the show, probably the most intelligent person on the show, and yet she is actually in the dark more than any other character. And a lot of the times she's operating under that whole Hitchcock principle of show the bomb, but don't show the characters the bomb. And half the time you're like, Kim, no, don't, oh my God. So what, what, is, the, what is it like, the, what, what's the room like as you're starting to prep and break each season story-wise? It just gets to be more of a headache every season. I think that's, I think it's fair to say, uh, you know, fortunately we have uh, the brightest bunch of people around, uh, including uh, our writer's assistant for, uh, that's the season we're talking about, uh, Ariel Levine, who's also, um, who's also now, uh, now a writer and she wrote the finale with me. And one of the things that she wow. does is to watch uh, all of Breaking Bad. I don't know if she watches Better Call Saul also, I'll have to ask her, but she <laughs> seems to have uh, a lot of the details at her <laughs> fingertips. Having said that, uh, I think one of the things that we worry about a lot is whether um, the lies are clear to the audience and whether whether people are understanding all the uh, the wheels within wheels that we have going on. Uh, and we're very lucky because it's, it, I think we've got a really, really smart audience. And so you, so far, so far, I don't think we found that we've confused people too much, but sometimes the characters get confused. Um, I don't know, it, it, you know, it's, uh, we should toss this to someone else in the room. There is no pecking order uh, that I'm not aware of. Uh, we, we, all peck, we all peck at the story at the same time, more or less. Oh, cool. Um, does anyone else want to run with that? Or I have other questions. I'm not going to try to nerd out. There's going to be questions and stuff in the chat, obviously. It's a constant juggling act. Can you hear me? I don't even know if I'm on this thing. Hi, Tom. Hey, how are you doing? Tell you, I can't Hi. deal with technology. Um, Hi. Uh, yeah, it's a constant juggling act of who knows what, when. It's, uh, you know, I think we've made mistakes along the way that I hope nobody notices. <laughs> but uh, we're, we're trying our best. Um, yeah, Nacho, yeah, Nacho's lying to everyone. Um, so that's actually pretty easy. Everything he tells is a lie to somebody. Yeah, but yeah. you have to, I mean, how aware do you have to be of how aware he has to be of what lie he's told each person and what, where that person is on his own? I mean, I, the, the, that character is, it's, it's exhilarating, but also really unpleasant to watch him sometimes because your guts are just churning watching yeah. him live second to second. Well, he's he's incredibly smart, but he's made a very <laughs> dumb decision getting involved with these guys. Yes. So now that he's in, he tells Saul, Jimmy, once you're in, you're in. And he, he's been trying forever to get out of this thing one way or another, whether to buy himself out in season one or murder his way out in seasons two and three. And he knows all the lies, but he's now under Gus Spring's thumb. And he, he pretty much knows he has to do whatever Gus says. Another advantage advantage we have uh just to jump in is is we have michael mando playing this role yes. and michael is an incredibly expressive actor he's some you can see the mm -hmm. wheels turning 
inside his head. And the, the, to me, the joy, one of the joys of, of doing this, this particular kind of writing is that you get to write to actors and you get to know them better and better and what they can do. And uh, that's been, what we found is that Michael can, in a weird way, we don't have to explain as much as we used to because Michael uh, just brings it every time. And as long as he understands where the character is, it, right. it, usually, it usually just comes through. Now, oh, go ahead. No, sorry, just one, one other thing that I feel like we ba try to balance is something that we refer to as Tom's Law after that, based on our Tom Schnauz here, mm -hmm. uh, which is about if, <coughs> if a character on screen knows something, then the audience assumes that they know it too. And if you get so far away that it seems like they should know it because the audience thinks the audience knows it, so they think the characters should know it. And then they start to look dumb if it goes too long. So we sometimes have to sort of, those lies that within lies, we have to kind of blow up sometimes because it just gets to a point where it's like, shouldn't everybody know this? I know this. So aren't they dumb if they haven't picked up on this? And so there's the, the, the balancing act of what the knowledge that, that anybody has that doesn't make them seem like they're behind the, like they're behind the audience. They're, they're so far behind that they're stupid. It's a trap that I feel that a lot of TV shows get into. Of We have to explain everything, but you have to trust the audience and let them assume they know as much as a character does or a character knows as much as they do. And it's a shorthand and it's done us very well so far. Now, um, I, I, I remember it was either last season or maybe yeah, late last year, either Peter or Tom or somebody posted, and I, I took a picture of it on Twitter, the board for the final episode of Breaking Bad, the cards and how insanely detailed it was mapped out. But especially this season, watching kind of the rise of Kim Wexler, have there been moments where, despite all of your planning, despite all of your plotting, have characters kind of, and this has happened, it's, it's the most thrilling thing for a writer when you're writing, and the character gets out of your hands and makes decisions on their own, and especially that confrontation between Kim and Lalo in the penultimate episode felt like Kim just breaking away from this whole staff and going, God damn it, no. And that scene was so intense and amazing. To, what, who wrote that? Where did that come from? Because it was incredible. That was my episode, but we formed it as a group. I mean, everything we do on the series is done as a group of writers coming up with ideas and I honestly don't even remember what point we decided that Kim was going to confront Lalo. I mean, we knew that we wanted her to be in danger and everyone to be in fear of her dying because she's not in Breaking Bad. So, you know, when, when is that going to happen? I think everyone's on edge of what's going to happen to Kim Wexler. So we knew we wanted her to be in a, in a scene with Lalo and the idea of her being triumphant. I, again, I don't honestly remember. Maybe somebody can jump in and help me. <laughs> you know, how did, how do we... <laughs> come to that it just it just sort of happened naturally i mean we don't plan too far ahead and we let the scripts you know evolve and unfold as we're as we're breaking them and we just got to that moment i i think Patton, we're very lucky we have that moment you're talking about a lot where the characters start um dictating and i think that's yes. maybe the trick if there's a trick to this in my, in my opinion it's to uh listen to the characters and don't try to force them into 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 a scene or a situation that you think you want to have uh if, we, if we're honest with ourselves about what who these people are uh oftentimes they surprise us and that is a, a great example but we've definitely seen kim uh kim kind of kind of come to jimmy's rescue in a certain way before <laughs> You're right this is this is this really she she and of course, Ray Seahorn, again, you know, it's Tom has, he, by the way, he directed that episode also, not just, he didn't just write it. Um, the, the, the uh, you know, the incredible advantage we have of having the, having these performers uh, to, uh, uh, to, to, to say these words and to take these actions is can't be, can't be underestimated, overestimated. Or yeah, under, one of the two, either over or underestimated. Yeah, because there are certain moments, uh, certain scenes, and again, getting back to Rhea Seahorn and how amazing she is, when she confronts that old guy that's still staying on the Mesa Verde property and won't leave, and, and just gets in his face and drops her kind of cold professional attorney shell and gets in his face about it, she performs it 
with that I've just stepped off a cliff and maybe I've just gone too far, but I cannot stop myself. And so how much talking with the actors do you do before certain scenes about this is your character is now completely out of their comfort zone and has stepped off a cliff basically and doesn't know where they're going to land. Kim does not like look like, Kim is not a character that likes to make moves without knowing how they're going to end up. And to see her violate that sometimes is incredible. You know, it's just fascinating. She's just an amazing character. So like, do you, how much, how much do you get to talk to the actors before things are being shot? Or are you still writing episodes as they're shooting the season? Well, we, we are definitely writing as we, as we, as we shoot. And we, uh, one, of the, one of the approaches that we use that it, it's really what Vince started on Breaking Bad, which is to have the writers uh, go to Albuquerque and produce their own episodes. And so there's usually, not always, but usually there's a writer on the set. And the scene you're talking about is written by Ann Cherkis. Uh, and she wrote the hell out of it, of course, as mm -hmm. she always does. And, 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 and usually the, the writer is there and not even on the day, usually, because I, I think it's fair, Ann, Ann should speak too, but- Yeah, but, Ann, I, I wanna know about the that. actors read least. the scripts so far ahead. Um, well, they don't, I, not, far, not far ahead, but they think about them an awful lot mm -hmm. before they get onto the set. And, and, uh, and so especially, questions- Especially Ray Seahorn, she's so detailed in her work. I talk to Ray more than any other actor I mean, Bob's close, but Ray digs into every scene and is so thorough. It's fantastic to work with her. Yeah. yeah. Um, yeah. Anne, could you speak to that? Yeah, no, agreed. I mean, Ray is incredibly smart and thoughtful. And especially with that, those Acker scenes, uh, we did a lot of work together once I was in Albuquerque. I mean, we, one of those speeches we <laughs> I rewrote it and rewrote it and, you know, was sort of going to Peter and it was back and forth and it was just getting it to the point where everyone, especially Ray, felt like she understood it because she's so, she's so detail oriented that sometimes she'll just, we'll talk about a word, you know, that she's like, I don't, I don't think I would say that or that doesn't feel, I don't know, it's, it's, I've never uh, experienced that with actors before, this kind of uh, granular detail. And so it's really, um, I mean, of course, you know, the script is written, but then we, we, take, we take the actors, you know, ideas and, and notes into, you know, really into consideration. Um, and that one was a particularly, um, that one took a lot of work which is which is fun I mean, it's really fun to also have those kinds of conversations with actors because before i was on the show i never did that so wow you know it's it's a great i mean i'm just learning a lot from these amazing people yeah i yeah. will say i think ray the the approach she usually takes is with me anyway is help me understand what's really going on here. Mm -hmm. and, and sometimes it will end up being a word that's hanging her up, but it's, it's never, um, I, I don't know, I, I, it never gets, to, tell me if this is right, and it never, doesn't usually get to, I wouldn't say this, I'd say that, because she's mm -hmm. trying to understand the character just like we are, and, right. and it, uh, it's, it's fun. Yeah, absolutely, it's a nice dialogue back and forth. Uh, there was a really startling moment this season for me. I believe it was the third to last episode where they had the flashback to Kim Wexler's childhood. Now, you guys have done flashbacks, you know, Breaking Bad, there were flashbacks to Walter White when he was a younger professor. You've shown flashbacks of Gus, flashbacks of Jimmy. But to show something happen to one of these characters as a child, unless I'm mistaken, I don't think there was ever a flashback to early, early childhood where there is an event that just imprints so deeply. And that all it is, is that moment in a parking lot just being picked up, but it so informs everything that Kim Wexler does now in that brief little moment. Um, was there any talk about, do we, do we go back that far into the, into the character? Does this like, cause that was amazing. Well, that was a teaser we've been talking about for a while and looking for a place to place it. And that was the episode in the end where she is almost going to break up with Jimmy, but then decides to say, let's get married. And we felt like there was something in her past that maybe 
something went wrong with someone personally in her life that may have, you know, her mom's something maybe tragic or maybe they just stopped talking to each other and it hurt her throughout her life. It's details that we don't have, we don't, haven't really nailed down, but there's a sense that something bad happened in, in her childhood and we wanted to get to the end of this episode and feel like, well, why would she not want to pull, you know, the obvious thing is to get the hell out of Jimmy's leg because he's, he's a loose case. He's a, he's a chip with a machine gun, as Chuck said. And so <laughs> why would she say, let's get married? And we feel, maybe there was something to do with her mom and what happened there that felt like I need to draw him closer instead of pushing him away. Um, it was a particularly big deal because the Pat Kim's past is such a mystery. You know, we, we know so little, we don't, we know so little about her family. So it was like opening a window for the first time, which is exciting. Yeah. It's also, it, it's tricky because you don't want to, you don't want to explain the character. You know, you don't want to say, well, ex with, exactly. The tricky thing about flashbacks, you don't want to have a, you don't want to have it be, you know, the child is the father of the man or the, you know, the people don't right. change. People don't change because people do change and they evolve. So trying to find the right thing that had enough, I don't know, ambiguity, if that yeah. makes any sense, was, was really tough. I was, I was ha really happy with that. Um, I'm going to ask one more question and then I'm going to dip into some of it because there's some really good questions coming in the comments. I don't want to uh, take up all this um, uh, time, but really quick. Uh, and this is kind of to all the writers, even though you show only little detailed parts of it, it's kind of clear that you guys have a pretty good idea of both how the Salamancas and Gus's drug distribution empire works. And have there ever been moments when you're going, yes, we're writing a TV show. Yes, it's a crime TV show. But we have kind of worked out a blueprint as to how to run a criminal empire on screen. I, I remember famously that whoever it was that wrote Die Hard 3 was called in by the FBI because he did so much research as to how to actually knock over the Federal Reserve. I feel like <laughs> you did put on film how to knock over the Federal Reserve. So we need to talk to you about this. So have how deep does that research go and how, you know. Well, that's why we're ending season six because after this we got a we got a deal going on. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Where the real money is. Yes. <laughs> we just want to keep working together. <laughs> <laughs> wow there you go oh, you know what oh i like that but i mean like are, are there aspects to gus's background and the salamanca's background that are just on a dry erase board somewhere for you guys that will that no one will ever see the light of day but you have it in your heads to keep in mind or yeah i mean we we like to do as much research and and sometimes we will do the research and we don't actually, it would be a smart idea to put it on a dry erase mark. Uh, <laughs> we, we just do the research when we're, when we're coming up against a problem and then kind of forget it and then go, how did this work again? And then have to kind of reinvestigate what it looks like for whatever moment. It, right, it right. Like. But it's always, we want to know, we want to know as much as we can of the real way that something works and then keep give it just the shades like you say just the pieces that we can put on screen uh you know which is a, a, a thing we did with you know meth making in in breaking bad and and with the law with, with legal specific legal practice here just know it in detail and then put out as little as we possibly can so we're not giving blueprints of how to launder money or or whatever but it still feels like you know how to launder money once you watch an episode yeah yeah no i know what you're saying um Okay, I'm gonna ask, uh, we're gonna go to some of the, uh, the discussion questions because some of these are really, really good. Um, a, a very uh, timely one right now, which is um, what are your um, uh, thoughts on um, writer's room switching to virtual rooms? How are you guys managing that? Are you meeting in a virtual writer's room every day? And <laughs> <I'll> <laughs> Yes, we are. <laughs> I like how Colette and Babu have like these gorgeous backgrounds behind them. Like they're tormenting the other writers. Like, yes, yeah, just having some Campari at my villa. Well, you got yeah. <laughs> like, <laughs> how, how is the virtual room working out in terms of breaking this next season? <sighs> <It's just> difficult. <laughs> <laughs> it's difficult. We have a, we have a real shorthand when we're in a room together. And now the technology is we have to, we're, we're now raising our hands when we want to talk. And it, there's a different flow and it's, it's taking us 
longer to get through an episode right now at the moment. We haven't quite mastered this technology. Um, it's just it's just awkward. There's something about being in a room and and being with the board that you're working on, as opposed to having a digital. Now I write down, I write down stuff on a on an index card. I'll take a picture of it, send it to Jen Carroll, mm -hmm. who'll digitally put it on a on a separate board online that we can all look at together at the same time. It's just more time consuming, and there's just something missing in the process that I can't mm -hmm. quite put my finger on. <laughs> Did it's you not, see what that card said that he just held up though, Tom? You just sent you just held up the send help card. Mm -hmm. That's our regulars, yeah. Oh, really? It, it's very it's, hard to interrupt each other in the way that when you're in the room, you can hear what other people when somebody else says, nah, nah, and then you can you intuitively know how to seed to that person or just pitch dialogue over on top of each other when you're building a scene so that everyone's got th someone throws in a line and someone else throws in a line. But Zoom, at, at its best, it's, it's a, an amazing piece of technology, but it kind of makes the decision of, of who to listen to. And it kind of right. makes it so that people get cut off. Uh, so it's, it's much harder to kind of, it's a little more sequential than on top of each other sometimes, which Yeah, yeah I don't uh, shit on the technology. I, look, this is, even with doing it through Zoom, it is the best job to have in the world. I'm very thankful. Yeah. Uh, it's yeah, just yeah. different and we have to do it this way because of the circumstances. So that's, it's unfortunate, but I'd rather be in a room with my, with my buddies uh, breaking mm -hmm. the story. I, I will say, I will say that uh, as, as much as we complain about it, we have, uh, we just finished breaking episode two of the next season. And uh -huh. I, I think, I think the first two episodes just rip. I think they're great. I love them. So uh, even though it is, it's a little bit of an uphill battle, and it always is. And you know, we're always complaining about it. But th this is, gives us something new to complain about. And uh, I, I miss I miss everything these guys say. I, I would imagine it's a lot like being a, a performer. And you see, you know, you see, you're watching SNL. Uh, you see that they're, you know, as as great as the work people are doing is, it misses something yeah, yeah. Uh, by being in front of a live audience. Um, a Jillian Molin is asking, and I'm asking this because of Tom holding up the card. Can you please explain how you create one story beat on a card? Like what conversations do you have where this is what information needs to be on this beat? Um, as opposed to the, uh, back in the X-Files, we used to really distill it down. A card would be a scene. Now we get... We've expanded. If you've seen our boards online, they're very detailed. Yes. We put a lot of dialogue in. Um, so we'll just try to hit every important point on an index card. So when we're looking at it, we could read it and get a sense of the scene mm -hmm. uh, together as a group. So it, some scenes, there's card creep and they get longer and more bloated. But um, you always try to keep it to the minimum as, as best you can. Uh, it's hard to explain. It's just as a, as you're writing it down, you just try to get all all the information in as the fewest cards possible. Wow. Yeah, I mean, we all. I mean, we have well, not not in this format, but when we're in the room, we all do our own carding for an ep. Like mm -hmm. if we know we're writing an episode, we're the ones that do the cards and then put them on the board because it actually helps you sort of. Uh, take in the story and understand the story and sort of marinate it in a way, you know, just like when you write anything down, it, you mm -hmm. sort of maybe understand it better or just more thoroughly. So, I mean, my uh, carding is, it's not easy. It's not easy. And it's taken me a bunch of seasons to be able to um, do it in a way where people don't make fun of me. <laughs> <laughs> um, I get a lot from Tom. <laughs> I um, there's, here's a pair of questions that actually go together very well, and they're, they seem silly, but they're actually kind of interesting. Brian Johnson um, is asking, how did you land on Cinnabon, which he thinks is perfect, and are they fans of the show? Obviously, they have to be aware that they're Jimmy's hiding place. And then uh, a James DeLorean is asking, will there be a full Gene episode where it takes place during his viewpoint and time now? Uh, I can answer. I can answer the uh, the first one because that was uh, that was an episode of Breaking Bad that that I wrote. Uh, it was the last one that I wrote um, on that show, and we had we just had a piece of dialogue where where Saul Goodman says, you know, best case, and he's basically talking about a miserable life. He's best case scenario, 
um, you know, a year from now, I'm managing a blank. And what we had at the beginning was hot topic. And okay. I, I will admit that I was always pulling for Cinnabon uh, because <laughs> I just find something. Uh, I got to be careful here because they've been very good to us. I, it's something endearingly funny about Cinnabon. And, and so I, I, as, we, as we move forward with the episode, it was hot topic for a bit. And then um, I kept saying, well, what about Cinnabon? And but in the hot to- we kept going with Hot Topic. And then Vince found out that Hot Topic was actually selling Breaking Bad swag. And, and, and he said, well, that's going to look, that's gonna yeah. look like, that looks like we're promoting our own, our own, our own T-shirts. A little synergy. So, so we, got, we got to make it Cinnabon. And, it was this, and of course, we weren't showing Cinnabon and Breaking Bad. But uh, yes. as, soon as, the sh- as soon as the episode aired, Cinnabon tweeted about it and tweeted, oh. you know, there are jobs available in Omaha. <laughs> always had a great sense of humor about it. And they've been, they've been wonderful, frankly. That's I mean, great. I, I, we're so lucky. They've, uh, they've, they've you know, they, at the beginning, they actually flew one of their top executives into Albuquerque uh, to teach, to help teach Bob how to make a Cinnabon and make a shake. And I, 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 I they never sold his Cinnabons because they didn't look perfect. But I drank his shake and it was delicious. Oh, there you go. So a little info, inside information. Bob Odenkirk makes great milkshakes. He does. Um, the, um, I'm gonna add, there's a question here um, from, uh, from Paul Middlebach is asking about episode eight. And I'm gonna tag it to my own question, which is episode eight, the season was a kind of mind blowing mash of a treasure of the Sierra Madre, Wages of Fear. Lawrence of Arabia and other Westerns. Um, were any of those movies on your mind as you wrote it? And, and I also would like to ask, every episode, both of Breaking Bad and Better Call Saul have these incredibly memorable visual moments that, you know, the teddy bear floating in the pool in this season, that ice cream cone slowly being um, covered in ants. Are you aware of, obviously, of creating great visual moments that there's, there's visual poetry to it? And are also, I... I actually can't think of any time that you ever like referenced another film. Do you go out of your way not to try to reference stuff that's happened before and have this be your own world? I, well, I'm going to turn most of that question over to Gordon. I will say we have referenced on, on Breaking Bad. We did not reference movies, but on Better Call Saul, we decided that Jimmy is a movie buff. He's a yeah, big so movie had, buff. We had an episode where he did a, a montage that was very much in the mold of all that jazz. And he says, he says, it's from the movie. Uh, you know, he's admitting that he's, he's kind of, uh, he says, it's showtime. Yeah, when he's getting up and putting the stuff in his eyes, and he goes, yes. it's showtime. Oh. It's showtime. And so, you know, we're movie buffs. Uh, uh, and, and so, and Jimmy's a movie buff too, which liberates <clears throat> us to some of that. Uh, about episode eight in particular, uh, this season, Bagman, I, I, I would think Gordon would be the best to answer any questions about oh. that. Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we definitely, we talked about most of those episodes, most of those movies at some point when we were working on it, when we were breaking it, um, those were reference points that were heavy in our heads. Um, certainly things that I, I, I went and rewatched Lawrence of Arabia. I watched a Russian movie called Letter Never Sent, which is a, another sort of survival in the wilderness uh, oh. epic, um, which is really beautiful. Um, so, so I think we, I think for us, we love to be able to make things feel like the, the, the great, you know, the, the stuff that inspired us, but not hopefully make it feel like a ripoff or make it feel like we're just, we're just repeating. If, 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 it, if we were just repeating, then I feel like we, we tend to steer away from that and go like, I feel like I've seen that. I don't want to see that. But if it's something that gets you the feeling of of something like Treasure of the Sierra Madre or like Lawrence of Arabia or something like that, but isn't just recapitulation, uh, then we're all for it and, are, and and would love to do it as much as we can. And with the visuals, I mean, we, Vince very early on always talked about the Stanley Kubrick quote of, uh, you know, non-submergible moments. And we always try to put those, just things that you can't forget. You just want to have something peppered throughout an episode or, or the series that people will just remember and never be yeah. able to forget. Not every moment has to be that and it's impossible to do that. But if you have them along the way, it becomes this thing that you just can't forget and it's, it's sticking in your mind. For me, it's I have to say it's part of what's so thrilling about working on this show. 
because I joined the family on the later side and to learn the visual language of the show and of the world and to learn to think uh, cinematically in such a specific and kind of epic way has, is, is really incredible. Just working with writers who are also filmmakers and thinking through each episode as a movie is really cool. Wow. Agreed. I've learned so much. Yeah. Work show. Now, have there been any happy accidents on Better Call Saul, like on Breaking Bad, where, for instance, that day that Bob Odenkirk couldn't get back to the set so that you had to bring in Jonathan to play um, Mike Ehrmantraut, uh, and also for the finale when uh, there was a mistake with the wristwatch, which then turned into that amazing moment when he leaves his wristwatch on the payphone. Um, have there been moments like that? I don't know about accidents, but certainly, I mean, very early on, I, I attribute a lot of our success to Michael McKeon because it was his personality that really changed the character of Chuck and made us, made us end season one the way that we did. Um, so it's not really, I wouldn't say it's an accident, but it was just fortunate that he, he is the person and actor that he is and has the person that personality. Uh -huh. And so when it came time, we had no plans for Chuck to stab, Jimmy in the back the way he does at the end of season one by uh, telling uh, Howard Hamlin not to hire his brother because he's, you know, my God, University of America Samoa, who could hire this guy? So <laughs> that that came much later. Um, that's the only thing that pops in my head as far as like maybe what's an accident, you know, something we didn't plan to happen, but luckily it did. And then along those lines, EE e. is asking, is it more challenging as writers knowing where these characters end up and having to get there than if you were able to write their endings fresh or is, or have there been moments when you're like, oh, we had planned for it to go this way, but now we realize it's better if it goes this way. What would, what would you say the balance would be? I mean, it is a combo. You know, we, we go, as these guys say, brick by brick, one thing follows another psychologically and we all sit there like tortured psychiatrists trying to understand the brains of our characters and what feels right and of course people behave illogically too so it's like when does it make sense to be yeah. totally illogical and surprising as we all are in our own lives sometimes too your combination of uh predictability and unpredictability <laughs> so sometimes we know where we're heading and we head there step by step and it makes sense and other times we think we know where we're going and as you were saying when you first started you know talking to us the characters surprise us and and pull us in a different direction and, and i think along with what Allison's saying i think the challenge is often taking the just the, the sort of plot element of like who lives who dies off the table how do you make that interesting like when we were working on bagman it's like <laughs> neither of those characters die they, we know that they don't they live they they're alive they they survive until till breaking bad but we needed to make them sort of understand what the stakes were that weren't about life or death that were about what the state of their characters were what the state of their relationships were what their emotional journeys were and mm -hmm. so it's not just are they going to live because we kind of know that but you want to make it feel compelling what when we if we know the sort of blunt end point of a story is there a new light that we can shed on the rest of it that tells us something interesting about the character and make it, makes it feel compelling because we're learning something about them? What's the biggest thing that each writer has learned working on the show or some epiphany or revelation you had? Because every show has its own personality, has its own world, and you use different muscles or learn different things. Can we kind of go around if there's new stuff you guys learned working on it? or? Well, yeah, I mean, prior to, the, prior to this joining the Breaking Bad universe, I don't think I really let the characters take me away. I would set, you know, this is where I want to get to. And by hook or by crook, I'm going to make my characters go there. And it just letting that go uh, really brought me a, an enormous amount of freedom just to be invested in and make the characters interesting and complex and then have them guide you, you know, where, where are they telling you to go? And it's a, it was a really new form of writing. Likewise, I, I was never, I never wrote so organically before. I always, I was a big planner very, mm -hmm. you know, in my writing, you know, like incredibly detailed outlines. I knew where the character was going to end up and I just had to get there. And, you know, even if 
in the end, it didn't quite hold together as a story. And now I just have this whole new way of, of thinking about writing a story. And that has, uh, you know, it's helped me tremendously, or it will help me. Yeah, yeah painting, painting, painting your characters in the corners that you don't know how they're going to get out of. Yeah, and true. then as a group, you have to figure out how the hell, I mean, that was one of the biggest things when I joined Breaking Bad in season three, getting Walt and Jesse trapped in an RV with Hank outside. We're like, well, what the hell do we do now? <laughs> and we spent days trying to figure that out. Wow. And it was really uh, an eye-opening experience. In a way, I feel like I answered the question earlier by talking about the, the you know, visual and cinematic world of the show. I started as a playwright, and, oh. so the, and I, I've worked on a bunch of different shows, and I feel like each one has been kind of a step towards learning how to um, you know, build story in a, in a visual and ongoing and cinematic way. And this, this has, you know, this is like, uh, a, a very incredible example and opportunity for that. I also feel like this process is deeply collaborative in a way that is that is so gratifying, and it, it's deeply, you know, collaborative within the room. Like Tom was saying, how we all are really digging into every single episode, and also on the set. I, I feel like the culture of the show, as set by Peter and Vince, is to really honor the artistry that is brought in by everybody else who is making the show come to life once we get to Albuquerque. And that has been, um, that has been amazing for me, to really uh, understand the cinematography and collaborate with the costume designer and all of the department heads and everybody who's, who's coming together to make the show is, is honored and um, acknowledged and, and needed. So I, I really love it. Wow. That's great. Um, well, I, else? I, I, um, I've spent my, my entire professional career uh, on, on this show, on these shows. I started as a PA on Breaking Bad. So this is, this is like, I've had all of my training here. So I've learned, <laughs> learned a lot uh, from, 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 from this, these shows. I think one thing that I, you know, I came out of film school and you, you have a lot of things in your head from coming, coming out of film school about how to write a script. Um, and one thing that I, I think I've really learned and, and taken to heart is like, no matter how good your dialogue is, use less, you know, boil it down. There's less, you, you need less than you think. And if you, if you ever have a choice between a line of, lever, a line of clever dialogue or a slug line that will help somebody reading the script understand what's going on inside of the character, cut the dialogue. It's, 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 you, we, there's some, there, the scripts, if you ever read one of our scripts, they're very, they're, they're aired out. And is, as we say, so that when, when somebody reads them, you don't just get a, you, you get a sense of the turns of the scene. We try and give, you know, people, at least what we understand, our best, as, as Allison said, that's always partial. The actors are going to read it. Other, the directors are going to read it. And they're going to say, well, you know, I feel like this might be this, the turn in the scene. And they're going to change that. But at least we have, we've thought about it so we can give you a leg up and see like, okay, well, this is what we think is happening between these two lines. This is what we think is happening inside the character. So that there's a baseline to start from. And I, that's been incredibly technically useful to be freed up to be like, all right, I don't, I want to be parsimonious about my use of the slug lines, but at this end, you know, tight. But at the same time, yeah. having the freedom to say, "Hey, this is the this is the journey. This is what's important. Is is what's going on inside the people, not just how clever they are when they're speaking, or you know how what the razzmatazz of of the the scene, uh, you know, as it's moving through space is, but like the interiority." Right. Right. Yeah, I I agree with that, Gordon. I've I've never in in my career I had never written that way. I had never written. Well, except for maybe one other show, but it wasn't as explicit. I, I've never written so much description because we we really want to, and just the idea of your writing for, uh, you know, a production that is going, it's going to be a script that's going to be made. You know, I started out in features and most of the scripts I wrote early in my career never got made. And so this is, it's a whole different thing because there are lots of, uh, details that you want to communicate to the different departments you know whether it's your your costume designer your production designer uh your cinematographer whatever and so i had never i had never worked that way before and um 
I don't know. It's very, and again, with the dialogue, it's definitely less is more. So, um, and now I can't imagine doing it any other way because you want to sort of, you want your reader to be along on the ride with you. And that means giving them certain details that are not in dialogue. Wow. Wow. Um, now, now just, these are just some more fan uh, questions, but they, uh, they are very, the casting process. How did you find Rhea Seahorn? How did you find Tony Dalton as Lalo, a guy who, the, I, I've never seen an actor, the calmer and friendlier he gets, the scarier he is. Uh -huh. um, just incredible. And then of course, Michael as um, Nacho, just where did you find these guys? That these, these actors are amazing. You know, we, we are so lucky. Uh, we have uh, uh, the Ali Thomas, Sharon and Sherry and, and Russell, who are the um, just remarkable casting folks, casting people. They, they, they have such, uh, a deep understanding of performances and of, of performers and they love performers. They love actors mm -hmm. and they have brought us, you know, yeah, we get to look at a lot of people, but we know uh, they're going to bring us somebody really special. And, you know, with Tony, um, it's a great example because we gave them this, you know, this, it was an interesting, uh, interesting assignment. We wanted somebody who could be, Absolutely, he's a Salamanca, which means mm -hmm. that he's scary. But we also wanted uh, a certain charm, and they brought us uh, Tony Dalton. Uh, they brought us other actors who are also wonderful. But Tony has—he's got an Errol Flynn kind of yes. quality to him. He's got a lightness uh, to of touch, and a, and a and he 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 just adds so much to every scene. And you know, so I, it's really uh, how do how do we find them? We we watch the. We watch taped auditions sent to us by the best casting people in the business. That's how we wow. do it. Wow. What's also kind of crazy about all those people you mentioned, though, is that they, when, when we're casting larger roles, often we will generate, and we've been doing this for a long time now, sides that are not actually the scene. They're based on the scene that they'll be in, mm -hmm. but they are more than just Greeked with, with, with like, names changed, they will be entirely different scenes that try to mirror the kind of dramatic turns that they want to have to try and protect them in case the side. Uh, so we, we, we've done that. And then, the, then those people have to get the actual sides and read again. So they've, they've often gone through a couple of layers uh, of scenes. And sometimes that, that means that they're very confused about what exactly the show is or what we want to do. <laughs> because there'll be a scene about you know, something completely different before they get the scene that it actually, as it actually exists. But we, you know, the, the charm and all the, all the things that we're looking for from the actors, can, can, you can see them even if they're not reading the exact words, so. Um, someone asked uh, uh, Chata Oliver, any other spinoffs in the works? A show about the criminal veterinarian, my friend Joe DeRosa. Um, you guys really pay, you clearly pay attention to all of the side characters, uh, the, the, the man mountain guy that runs away in the parking garage shows up in the El Camino movie. Um, the other guy, that great tall thug that gets punched in the throat by um, Jonathan shows up brilliantly this season. Um, it, it's amazing how Mike Ehrmantraut immediately gets this guy's number, takes Saul Goodman and uh, Kim a little longer to realize what an idiot he is. But they're, they're still in the area. There's still this underworld going on with people that know each other. I mean, how, you keep, obviously you keep all that in mind or. Yeah, we have a board, we have a board with every character. Every character that has been in Breaking Bad is, appears in Saul and we write them on an index card and we stick them up on this board. And there's, there's always a reference to go to when we need somebody. And we haven't seen that board in like two months. Yeah. <laughs> I missed that board. <laughs> No. I don't know what we did. Or, you know, who's going to show up? We have no idea because we don't have the board. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, well, I know I can't ask this question because, you know, you got to wait till next season. But you, I, I'm assuming that everyone's tuning into this is caught up with this most recent season. But you end it on the, an apocalypse is about to happen, basically. So was that your, was that you guys' version of, 
let's not just write a character into the corner. Let's write our entire show into a corner. <laughs> and how do we get out of this now? Because the final image, you know, of Lalo, things aren't going to be good, <laughs> I, to say the least. Oh, boy. <laughs> I can't, <laughs> what, I can't say. We, what were we thinking? Uh, I don't know. Big mistake. We, big mistake. Yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. I do remember that I think Bob was interviewed, not for this season, but the previous season. And he said that when he comes to visit us in the room, which now, of course, he could only do virtually, uh -huh. he said, there's the smell of brains frying, <laughs> which is kind of disgusting. But now our brains are frying from staring at the screen. Right. Yeah, We're all exactly. together. <laughs> yeah. Oh, Alexis, I'm sorry. I didn't mean that as a spoiler. I just assume there's just, again, this is one of the, is one of the great cliffhangers. Like now, what the hell is going to happen? And also, it's a. I mean, no, I can't. I won't say it. I, the, I'll, <laughs> uh, I'll deal with you guys Come later. To the but, but, Skills Foundation or Better Call Saul. You better have watched every damn episode. <laughs> yeah, exactly. they should have. Why, why would you tune into this if you haven't been caught up with the show? Um. Uh. Oh, okay. What do you? Oh, Karen. Hi, Karen. Sorry, I didn't mean to. But she just asked, what do you foresee if the virus prevents you from filling in uh, the next season? What do you foresee? Like what happens or? Wow, Karen's really bringing us down. Sorry, Karen. <laughs> well, I mean, that was, a, that was a fascinating question. Hi, Karen. No, it's From okay, the whole Karen. writing staff out. We're, of course, we're worried about it. Yeah. I think for us right now, it's, it's, we're, we're lucky. We, it, it's unfortunate, but we, we were lucky in terms of the timing of when this happened to hit for us in our process, because as much as it's painful and sometimes frustrating uh, to work on Zoom, uh, we are able to work. We are able to do the work that we, we would be doing this work. We might be doing it you know, in slightly easier circumstances, but we would be doing this work at this point in the process. So hopefully we will just keep keep our noses to the grindstone and keep our fingers crossed and hope that there's some, some solution that can kind of come uh, and not put us too far behind when, it, when we would be getting into production. Um, okay, well, here's a more a practical question from Kimberly Bernard. Any advice for writers on how to be their most effective in a writer's room? Just general writer's room tips, please. And translate that also into being effective in a virtual writer's room, which is, seems to be the future for some of this stuff. I would say that the the best advice I, I, I would ever have is don't just pitch problems, pitch solutions. Like if you notice something that's going that where you say, oh, you know, this doesn't quite work for me in, in something that's being pitched. If you just say, you know, I don't like that. It stops things. It's, it's, it's right. sort of like an improv. You just, you just said no to somebody rather than saying, hey, I noticed this thing. I want, you have to be honest about that part too, but if you can, it's like, I have a, what is, could we do something like this? Here's my problem. Let me elucidate it as much as I can. And let me say, is there a way that we could shift what we're doing to, to incorporate that rather than just saying, because it, it, it's, it's very hard to, right. to overcome just no. I think that one of the tricks to the writer's room is to take any idea that comes up and try to pursue it try to ch chase it down and see where it goes because sometimes something that can sound really unpromising or not interesting to you. Uh, if you keep thinking about it and take it from every angle and say, well, what does this other character think of this? If, if you, as long as you're, as long as you're moving things forward, you're helping. I mean, that's the, that's uh, Gordon said something very important there. And I say that as a, a, a somebody who is on staff and is now, now running the show as long as we're moving forward, I'm happy. As long as I feel like we're we're coming up with interesting, interesting ideas. And mm -hmm. but the other trick I think is to look back. Is to look back. Don't just look at where you want to go. Look at where you've been already. And the closer, the more. If you're on a show, um, you want to be as familiar as possible with every episode of that show. And if it's a pilot, you want to want to be basically have memorized every frame of it. Uh, and 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 try, try to say you know because it's it's a great you know Breaking Bad is obviously the easy example for me. Uh, there are all these little clues in the first episode of Breaking Bad 
about where the project could go. And, uh, you know, like Walt had that little, um, he had that little uh, plaque that said he contributed to a um, uh, work that won a Nobel Prize. And so I think a lot of the time it's asking a question, what did he do? Where was, what was that? What could it be? And, and as long as, and also the other thing is you have to keep in mind, it's, it should be, and it's not, every room is not like this, it's play. You're supposed to be having fun and enjoying watching. You're watching the show in your mind. It may look like you're sitting around a table with a bunch of other people, but it's like you're watching this branching version of the show and all the different places it could go. And if your attitude is right, that's kind of fun. It's enjoyable. And if, oh. you're, it's, it's, if you're miserable, if, if, you're, if you're miserable doing it, then it's probably the wrong place for you. I think... You know, I would say if you're starting out and I still remind myself, listen, and then when you have something to say, spit it out. And if it doesn't land the way you hoped, don't worry about it, because as we all we like to say, a bad idea can lead to a good idea. Therefore, you know, it's cliche, but it's true. Therefore, there are no bad ideas necessarily, because even the thing that doesn't land could open up things in a different way. And then just also emotionally, I will say the more you can take your ego out of it, a good for me, a good day in the room is the room where my ego is not locked in and a bad day, and I'm happy to say I don't have very many of these anymore, but a bad day is when for some reason my ego latches on or I get hurt feelings. Or mm -hmm. The more you can not go there and just think of it as a collaborative effort to make something cool together, the happier you will be. That's a great way to put it. Yes, and it's um, very difficult. It takes, a, I think for me, it's taken a long time. And by the way, there are still days I feel that way. You know, I <laughs> feel like, We're human. oh, I did not do well today. You know, it just, I, I, I wish I wasn't like that, but I still have those moments and I just have to keep every day as a new day and a new chance to, you know, start over in a way. And uh, you, but I think also, uh, following what Allison said is feeling, hopefully you feel safe. There's a thing about feeling safe in a room where you could say anything. And even if it is idiotic, people won't trash you for it. You know, it's, it's like you want to feel like you could say anything because if you, if you feel that freedom and that openness, then something great will come out of it you know, but it's not every time, but you want to give yourself that chance to always say something, you know, something that will really help the episode or whatever. Wow. Wow. Um, okay. Well, we're wrapping this up here. Here's a little question from a Natten Poswalt uh, to Thomas Schnauz. You were fortunate enough to work with uh, actor Pat Oswalt on Reaper. Any plans to... <laughs> Um, secure some Emmys for your troubling <laughs> show by having him on as a guest. Well, that's, that's a little insulting. I don't know why they would put that in there. Anyway. Um, he's going to he's gonna be a part of the Salamanca family. <laughs> for sure. Yeah, just not problematic at all. Um, actually, the, I'm going to end on this question. It's to Peter. What, was the, what shift was necessary transitioning from being a writer to being a showrunner? I mean, do you miss just being a writer? Are there, what are the advantages and disadvantages? Uh, I miss uh, being a writer producer on Breaking Bad for a lot of reasons, uh, because I knew in the end, I, I had such and still have such faith in Vince Gilligan that I just knew it was always gonna come out mm -hmm. and it was always gonna work. Whatever we did was gonna work. I just knew it in my heart working with him. And so I don't have that anymore. Uh, I, it feels more <laughs> like it's not a, um, there's not a uh, there's not a safety net anymore, right, and it, right. I had to learn. Uh, and it's one of the hardest things for me to learn is that you have to make I have had and make anxiety my friend a little bit, and just and oh. just, just and, and go ahead and accept the fact that I'm uh, an anxious person, and there are certain times that that's just going to be a big deal for me, and uh, try to try to take care of myself, but mostly. Uh, Foc instead of focusing on me, focusing on the show and focusing on the characters has always has always turned out to serve us all in good stead. But it's been no, it was uh, that was certainly a transition for me. Uh, and and uh, uh, you know, it's it, I've had 
but both, I mean, look, these two greatest jobs, I'm convinced possibly the greatest <laughs> jobs that human beings have ever had are, mm. are work, the, working as a, um, certainly the best job for me, working as a writer, producer, and even director on Breaking Bad, and then, mm. and then getting to uh, create a show with Vince Gilligan and then run it. Uh, I, 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 you know, I sometimes joke that I'm going to wake up on a gurney uh, and this was all, this was all like a, a, a wonderful hallucination. I've had, I've had uh, nothing but fun and, uh, it's, uh, you know, stressful fun. Yeah. Wow. Um, well, everyone, thank you so much. This is, uh, thanks for, uh, doing this and everyone in the chat. Thanks for the questions. These were fantastic. Um, I guess we're going to wait and, and hope that the next season happens timely, but safely. Um, I, I, it, it is very, very fun. You've created such a surreal situation in which you have created a character that we don't, that everyone loves Kim Wexler that we don't know is if they're going to exist or not. And that living with that tension as a fan of the show is fantastic. So guys, thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Thank you. Thank you. What a thrill to have Pat and Oswald. Ah. Oswald fans. <laughs> We love you, man. And, oh, and thank, just, thank you. I, I'm so excited to, every time you show up on TV, I'm very excited to watch and, and listen to your comedy. And and, and uh, we, anyway, this was a dream come true. Well, wouldn't to it have, be have fun you, to do a panel with us? Wouldn't it be fun to hang out in Albuquerque with me? I mean, <laughs> I see me on TV, think of the thrill I of seeing so. me at craft service craft. first thing in the morning. Yeah. <laughs> I, <laughs> All right, guys. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thank right. you. Right. Bye.